And we are live in a living color from Smitar Studios in Denville, New Jersey, listening live to the Open Mic program right here on the one and only blogtalkradio.com. Welcome, folks, into the Sports Talk Nation as we've got a big show for you today. We go back into our spring training tour as we will talk about the Boston Red Sox as they get ready for what should be a very fascinating campaign here in the 2017 season. It's been a very fun tour so far, folks. And in case you are new to the tour, you you are just joining us because you see it's a Red Sox show. We've been doing this since the start of the month, really since the end of February. We're hitting up all the top teams that are coming into this year that either have been to the playoffs last year or are teams that could be in playoff p- potential teams this year. And we really want to give a good look at these teams and see what they have in store uh, for this season. And as I said today, we're going to be talking about the Boston Red Sox. We have a great guest on the line. That's from 27 Outs Baseball, and that is Chris Hogan. He will join us right now. We've had Chris on the show uh, before. We spoke to him just a few weeks ago uh, before Super Bowl 51. He joined us to talk about the Patriots, and uh, he can, he can, he, we'll give him a chance. He can gloat if he wants to a little bit because his Patriots came back from a 20 to, 28 to 3 deficit uh, to win that Super Bowl, but he joins us today to talk some Red Sox. Chris, how you doing? Doing, doing good, Mike. It's good to be back with you. How are you today? Doing great. Great, great to have you back on the program here today, Chris. Let's sure. just uh, let's just jump right into this now. We talk about this Boston Red Sox team coming into 2017, and as I said in the open, this is a, a team that comes into this year really with a fascinating a fascinating outlook on this season. A lot of people like this team to challenge Toronto, maybe even push Toronto for the division title. A lot of people think they could certainly be a wild card team. At the same time, this is also a team that did lose a couple of notable players uh, in free agency in the bullpen. And we'll talk about we'll talk about all that, especially uh, with Urahara and Tozawa, both of those guys going one to Miami, the other one to Chicago with the Cubs. So this Chicago, so this is a Boston Red Sox team comes into this year. They have Chris Sale now in this rotation. They have a, a lineup that is trying to transition a little bit as we're starting to see it, maybe in left field with one of their top prospects uh, getting an opportunity to transition a little bit to some of the younger players, and they still have a lot of uh, wily old veterans, if you will, on this ball club. So before we go into breaking down all the positions that we want to talk about here today, what are your initial thoughts about this Red Sox team coming into the year? Yeah, I think it's going to be another fun year, hopefully, but uh, a little bit of an injury worrisome of a couple guys so far. Um, uh, David Price is obviously going to start the year on the DL. Um, mm-hmm. maybe, maybe Tyler Thornburg in there. They just got in the bullpen. Carson Smith maybe a midseason return. Hopefully, hopefully earlier than sooner, but oh, yeah. then later I meant. But I think it's I think it's pretty good. Like I said, they still have a very deep offense. You know, obviously Big Poppy retired David Ortiz, but. You know, I think they can offset it with still a, lot, a pretty good lineup. Like I said, they're going to miss the 35, 40 home runs he's given them the last decade. But like I said, they could probably offset it. I think, you know, I'm I'm still worried about their pitching. Like you said, Lohara, Tozawa, two guys. You know, I think I don't. I, I really think the bullpen's still a question mark a little bit. And obviously, we'll get into that. But I still think they'll they'll be pretty good. Um, I I think the Blue Jays are probably gonna. You know, they're probably the second best team in that division. But and then the Yankees, Orioles, and Rays are kind of in the middle to lower tier. So. Mm-hmm. I'm pretty confident, but um, you know it's going to be interesting. Hopefully, the the injuries will not uh, pro, pro, prolong their success like they did because last year they uh, didn't have any injuries, which obviously led to the success. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we talk about the pitching, and we might as well start there. Let's talk, let's talk about this rotation a little bit first. Obviously, David Price being injured with the uh, elbow inflammation is is certainly not a good thing at all at any point in spring training, let alone here in the middle of mm-hmm. it. If they can, if he can come back soon, fairly soon, and be healthy for this team going into into opening day, that's obviously a huge plus. Now the good thing is the Red Sox aren't expecting him to start opening day. It's, he's right now penciled in. You want to say maybe a two or a three starter in this lineup because you have a guy guy like Chris Sale who they pick up in the off season, leaving the White Sox after all the turmoil he had last year in Chicago with the White Sox. He now comes over here to Boston. And I guess you could say he could be considered a de facto ace when you look at what he's been able to do in his career. A guy who has struck out 200-plus batters multiple times in his career. He doesn't walk guys. Has a pretty decent ERA. Had a pretty, pretty decent ERA last year. And then Rick Porcello, who had a very good, who had a really fantastic year last year, career year, winning 22 games. So I think from the top, from the, when you take a look at this rotation, first three guys going down, 
Porcello, Sale, and Price. It's a very good start to this rotation for this Boston Red Sox team if all pieces stay healthy. Yeah, and that's the big problem. You know, a lot of a lot of Red Sox writers and, and bloggers have kind of said this. You know, a lot of them think that it could be 15 to 20 starts, you know, ideally if – because they think this injury, elbow, shoulder, you know, arm injury – is a lot more serious than they think. But my thing is, you know, at least there's some positivity. He got the good news. He's not going to have Tommy John. He's doing some long toss right now. So maybe if he misses three, four starts, maybe does a rehab or so. So maybe, hopefully, if everything, maybe end of April, early May. So you're probably looking 26 starts, maybe 25. So I think that would. But, you know, I'm not too worried about the sale. Like I said, I think a change of scenery is going to really help him. Obviously, the Red Sox have a good clubhouse culture for the most part, uh, post-Terry Franco and Bobby Valentine Day. So uh, I think it's going to be pretty good. You know, I, he, he did he's pretty good in his first uh, spring training start against the Rays. I think he had about six strikeouts in a couple innings. So he was throwing 96 miles an hour, 97, So which he hadn't done, I don't think, a lot last year. So the velocity is obviously there. Um, the lower part of the rotation, I think, is going to be interesting. Obviously, you got Eduardo Rodriguez, Stephen Wright, and Drew Pomerantz. And uh, Pomerantz obviously struggled a little bit for, during his after coming over from the Padres. So, um, right now, like I said, for the first month, you're probably going to see Sale Porcello, I would say, a combination of Rodriguez, Wright, and probably Pomerantz. I mean, because uh, Joe Kelly, I think, is going to be a full time uh, seventh or eighth inning guy this year as well. So, I think it's a good rotation. I I still think the Blue Jays have a little bit better depth wise, but like I said, I think the Red Sox with Rice healthy, I still think I think it's one of the top in the AL. Uh, but the Blue Jays pitching, starting pitching is definitely up there too. But I'm not too worried. But I, my biggest question is is Rice going to have the same success he did last year because he really wore down at the end of last year, and will mm-hmm. Pomerantz really uh, turn it around as well because he really has some good stuff. But hopefully he can you know put in the area under four. Hopefully I'm hoping. Well, that's what you're going to hope for. And, you know, these are these are guys who give you four and five starters in the rotation. Correct. Obviously, the boss isn't, isn't expecting a whole lot from those guys, but you want to get good, solid starts from them throughout the course of the year. One thing about Wright that was that is a positive is if you take a look at what he did towards the end of the year, he did pitch. He did pitch very well. He did have a complete game against. Uh, he did have a complete game against the Dodgers early in August. Uh, now he did get roughed up a little bit in his last start, August 31st. Had some up and down mm. starts overall throughout the year. Didn't pitch in September. What do you, what do you expect from him? Maybe getting a, with a full getting a full year this year if he can stay healthy. Yeah, that's the biggest question. Obviously, the, some people projected him to be in the bullpen, but I think you know, obviously, kind of going kind of having the same mentality Tim Wakefield did, starting the bullpen your Red Sox career, and then. I, I'm not saying he's going to be a 40 game, 15 start type of guy, you know, shuffle in the mm-hmm. rotation and be a long reliever when need be. But yeah, you know, he had an ERA in the mid threes. If he can kind of duplicate that, it would be nice. You know, uh, maybe give him 150, 160, depending on where really where uh, the need is. And you know, I I really don't want to see him in the bullpen because I think that's you know underutilizing his strengths because. You know, he, he did very well. He had a good amount of strikeouts. He, had, he had got a lot of ground balls, you know, because he, he can also, you know, curveball and a, and a fastball. Mm-hmm. And he throws a little bit harder than Tim Wakefield. I think he can get up to about 92, 93. But, um, yeah, I, I could, you know, number four quality numbers, number four starter quality numbers, maybe, a you know, mid ERA in the threes. Even if it's high, it's fine. As long as he give him, stays healthy, I think that's the biggest concern. If he can stay healthy, I'm not too worried. Um, I think Eduardo Rodriguez uh, and Pomerantz are really more concerns than I would say Stephen Wright at this point. When you think about Rick Porcello, I mean, I, I don't I don't expect him to win 22 games this year. Obviously, expect those numbers to come down a little bit. But this is a guy who, I think, in a lot of ways, has been kind of underrated throughout his career. A lot of people overlooked him when he was in Detroit. They always talked about guys like Verlander for, for obvious reasons. But this has been right. a guy who's had a pretty solid career throughout throughout his major league career that goes back to 2009. And last year, the chance to shine this year is now the ex- expectation is here at age 28. He's in the prime of his career for him to go out there and possibly be the ace again, or a ace one, a, if you want with Chris sale, but we'll see. I- I'm really curious to see how, how he does pitch this year. I-, I do expect again, the numbers to come back up to a more, uh, I guess reality, if you will, from what we're used to seeing from Por- Porcel in the past, but Still a very, very solid pitcher who's going to be a big number two starter for this team. Yeah, and I yeah, I think at this point, you know, even if he's an open – I know he's not going to get the opening day start, but even if he does, you know, he could still be a number one. And, 
it really, you know, you can mix match sale price and for sale. You know, it really doesn't matter. They're all going to be quality stars. But, you know, I think that for the for the pressure not to be on uh, Porcello again, like I said, I'm not worried about the pressure of him having two other eight all-star pitchers with him in price and sale. But, you know, I think – I don't know if he'll come back to down to earth. I don't think so because I really – you know, ben, a lot of Red Sox fans gave Ben Sherrington grief in the, in the, before the 2015 season. Uh, for giving him four years, eighty million, you know the guy that's you know young, twenty four, twenty five at the time, and his ERA was in the mid four, so he was a more of a number three or four with Detroit at the time. But you know it, it obviously paid off last year. Twenty million is pretty a uh, pretty uh good number, I guess, or a bargain if you ask me for a uh, Cy Young award one of these days with with the amount pitchers are getting. So. Um, if the ground balls mm-hmm. are there, even his strikeouts were almost 200, and that's not like him. He was in the low 100s. He got more ground balls. His sinker was on. I think it was more him getting used to the playing in Boston because, like I said, a lot of players get too anxious or, you know, the expectation's huge in their first year in Boston, and I really think he fed it off. But, obviously, he got a ton of offense, and, the, and that helped him. So, you know, the Red Sox are used to score an 8-10 to 10 run, sometimes for 10 straight games. So, you know, the offense will obviously carry the Red Sox this year, but like I said, so they, they could have three or four guys maybe win 15-plus games this year. I really think that's how much the offense can, you know, offset a bad bad pitcher's night even if they, you know, win and still have a bad night uh, on the mound. So it'll be it'll be an interesting year for Purcell, but I think he'll be uh, maybe 15 games, 16 games, but he should still have a good year. I don't think he's phased by the pressure of Boston anymore, if you ask me. I, I would agree with you there. Let's take a let's take a look at his bullpen. We did open up talking about this just a little bit, and of course the two the, really three big moves. They lose Brad Ziegler, who goes to Miami on a two year deal, and then obviously Tazawa going over to Miami, also a two year deal. Uhara going to going to Chicago on a one year deal. When I really think about it, okay, Tazawa the last couple of years maybe didn't exactly have the kind of numbers you would like from a guy who was in the back end of the bullpen. ERA was over four, WHIP was up a little bit. At the same time, he was a big part, big piece to this bullpen uh, that will be missed. And as far as Uehara is concerned, if you ask me between the two of them, this would probably be the, the toughest one to make up because here's a guy who doesn't walk anybody. Uh, here's a guy who was a pretty decent closer for this team for a couple of years and made that transition to the setup guy and did the best he could in that, in that regard. And I think the Red Sox could miss him. The question is going to be is who do they find to be that setup guy in that eighth inning, that 7-8 bridge to get to Kimbrell. That's interesting, and obviously they they uh, gave up uh, an arm and a leg for uh, Tyler Thornburg, who kind of came on pretty good for the uh, Brewers. Uh, had a couple Tommy John surgery a couple years ago, and uh, really came on um, after they. He's a, yeah, they, he came on after the All Star break when he became their closer. So uh, it was very interesting because he was throwing ninety six, ninety seven, and you no, know, he's going to take a back step this year. I guess, like I said, he's going going through some arm injuries. Uh, arm problems right now, but I think he's thrown off the mound. So hopefully he'll be healthy for the start of the uh, season in about two and a half weeks or so. So we're looking him probably doing the eighth inning, maybe Joe Kelly doing the seventh inning, obviously Kimbrell. Who I, I have some concerns in a minute if we get to him. But, uh, yeah, as long as Thornburg, I think, you know, Uahara, I think is, is it going to be a uh, – he's going to be a – he's going to miss – be missed, I think, because like I said, he he was throwing that 80 mile an hour fastball, that splitter, getting a lot of strikeouts, ground balls, and he was pretty good. I mean, he's missed the last couple of years with some injuries, but he was he's been pretty good. And uh, Tazawa, his time has kind of uh, sailed a little bit, if you ask me, because um, he's been a little bit inconsistent the last couple of years. Yeah, he got a high amount of strikeouts, too many home runs, and the walks were kind of an issue. So. You know his ship just sailed, but I'm interested to see how their how their guys leading up to Kimbrel is going to be. Uh, Matt Barnes obviously did pretty good. He a little shaky from time to time. Uh, Hembry and obviously um, you got uh, Joe Kelly who's going to be you know transitioning to a bullpen role for the first time ever because with the Cardinals he was more of a uh, starter and reliever. So we'll have to see. But I think the bullpen's still a question mark. I'm not a hundred percent certain on it like I was last year. So. They need some work, and let's see how the pressure with Thornburg uh, really kind of transitions to his Boston days going forward. Yeah, I agree with you. And, you know, one thing about this this bullpen is, uh, from what I've noticed here in spring training, they've pitched fairly well, and these are some of the, the key guys that are going to be part of this bullpen. You mentioned uh, mentioned Joe Kelly, five games he's pitched well, hasn't given up a run thus far. Uh, Abad, another one who's penciled in right now, possibly as a bullpen arm, he has an ERA that's just around two. 
Uh, Hembry, from what I've read, uh, apparently doing a little bit better against left-handers this spring. He's working on that, going through, going in through that this spring, and hoping that he can kind of become a big part of this bullpen. Uh, he was got a little bit of a taste of it last year. They're hoping that he can be a, he can punch his way through this year. He's pitched pretty well in the spring training. Now, again, we always put a slight asterisk on this saying, well, it is spring training. We really don't know what these guys are going to do once the season begins. But I think the the best thing for the Red Sox is this. When you take a look at a lot of these guys, guys like Thorne Burke, and again, you, like you mentioned, trying to get healthy from the arm injury himself, Barnes, Kelly, Ross, even Hembry himself, all these guys are still somewhat in the pri- entering the prime or still in the prime of their careers. So when, from that standpoint, here's a chance for the Red Sox to really build a bullpen that they can have, not just obviously for this year, but for the next couple of years, and start to find some of these guys who can be that eighth inning guy, that seventh inning guy, who's going to be my bulldog out of this bullpen. These are questions that right now for John Farrell and his pitching staff and his pitching coaches, they really don't have an answer right now. And they're trying to get that answer here a little bit in spring training. And then once we get into the season, then we'll start to really find out where these guys are uh, as far as a bullpen is concerned. Yeah, I think so. I think the really the only set things you have is the left-handed, you know, a combination of the two lefties they're probably going to have. You know, obviously Robbie Ross has been a consistent guy. I mean, I'm not worried about him. He's, you know, mid-three ERAs, you know, good, solid solid for what he does. And then obviously for Abad struggled in his big t- in his time with Boston after coming over from Minnesota last July. And mm-hmm. uh, Robbie Scott, who really has been a journeyman uh, in the minors, and he really shined in his late August, early September uh, for the rest of the season type role. So I think uh, I think right now it would be Ross and probably Scott uh, as your – because I think Abad's really the man now. Unless he, you know, he, the last few weeks of the spring training can be a breeze for him, so we'll see. But, yeah, like I said, Matt Barnes, I think, you know, former first-round pick, was a starter at UConn, didn't really pan out too much as a starter in the majors. You know, did pretty well in the minors as a, as a starter, but – he, mm-hmm. he was pretty good. Like I said, I think Hembry, you know, he, it's it's up in the air. He was, uh, he was pretty good for them. Um, but my biggest thing is, you know, once Carson Smith comes back, like I said, hopefully it's May he comes back. I know he's still coming back from Tommy Johnson, maybe June. Um, I think he, he'll be a nice addition. Him and uh, possibly Kelly, Kimbrell, that's, that can look pretty good. And, I, but I, and Thornburg, obviously. But if the Red Sox both end struggles, they may need to, you know, I know some tra- teams trade a little bit in June slash early July. They may need to go out and get some because I'm not – the bullpen depth in the AAA and all that, Brandon Workman's coming back from uh, big – some some shoulder injuries and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. They don't really have the bull- the depth really in the minor leagues after that bullpen-wise. So I think a trade may be in, on the horizon early on if they see it as an issue. But my biggest thing is this Kimbrell – uh, his walks really need to diminish, really, if you ask me. His ERA was th- over three for the first time in his career. I mean, I think he had a pretty good year. Yeah, he, he had a good amount of strikeouts. But overall, I think mm-hmm. it was an okay first year. But uh, he really needs to cut back on his walks. So hopefully he's fully healthy this year. Yeah, that, well, that's what I've got hope for right now. It was weak because they really got to find a way to get this to get this bullpen meshed in the right, in the right, in the right order right now because if, they, if they're going to compete in this division – with teams like Toronto and Toronto, the, the top dog in this division still, I still think, I, I even think the Yankees could have a decent year this year. And I know they have their own issues with their pitching staff as well. If they're going to make a big move, the Red Sox in this division, they really need to have this bullpen shored up uh, throughout the course of this year. And as, as you said, a lot of injuries that they're trying to get over right now and get past as they try to uh, get through the middle part of spring training and get ready for the season. The one part of this team that, right now is not an issue is this offense and this offense, right? At least on paper right now, going into the season really, really does look good. I mean, you take a look up and down this lineup, you got experience, you got youth, you got a lot, you got power, you got all kinds of things that you would like speed, some speed as well. All the things that you would want to have on a, on a pitching staff or on a, on a lineup, I should say you have here with this Boston Red Sox team. So the first guy I really want to talk about, let's talk about the young man they have in left field right now. That's Andrew Ben Etendi, who is, <laughs> was one of their top prospects, is their top prospect. Got a taste of, of Major League Baseball last year, 105 at-bats. He shot up through the minor league system, through high, through high A and double A, and then finally got his taste in the major leagues. And he is right now going to get his chance uh, to be a big part of this team going into this year. Yeah, and the big and he's got one of the best hairdos, I guess you could say, around baseball. <laughs> but um, 
Yeah, I mean, it, it's definitely interesting because a lot of a lot of the Red Sox front office and the fans don't know where he's going to bat in the lineup. I think that's the first thing we need to kind of clear up, you know, in previewing him right now. You know, the Red Sox have talked about him batting third, and I, I don't, you know, I don't because he's not a he's got he's got developing power, and we think of a three guys as a, as a power hitter, twenty, thirty home runs a year, mm-hmm. uh, but not necessarily. But I think right now, if he if he's slated in the second spot, I think that'd be perfect for him. I think, like I said, he's a contact hitter. He's got. He's the number one prospect in baseball. He's got five tools, uh, I think so. Um, you know, I don't numbers wise, I don't know what to expect. I've seen anywhere from thirteen to fifteen home runs, fifty RBIs. But I, I think the one thing I think that will be there will be the defense and the uh, the on base percentage and the batting average. He mm-hmm. may not be a twenty twenty guy right away or a thirty thirty guy, but I really think you know in his first if he can hit somewhere between two two eighty two ninety. 13 to 15, maybe up to 20, almost 20 home runs, 60 RBIs and 20 steals and play good defense. I think the Red Sox fans will love that, you know, because um, that's that's one thing I think he's not – the effort's definitely there. Um, he's going to definitely feed off Jackie Bradley, you know, Hanley. He's going to have a, a lot of experience around him uh, that will obviously get him pumped up. So the talent's there, and I'm really excited because I, I love his speed, his defense. Uh, he's going to mm-hmm. be a good player. I really think he's 20-20 potential, maybe 30-30, but maybe more 20-20 and, and, and a good glove and a good average. So he'll be fun to watch this year for sure. Yeah, and, you know, also left-handed bat, batting in that ballpark with the pesky pole down the right field line, plus the short porches in Camden Yards, also Yankee Stadium. So he'll, he'll get his home runs. There's no question about that. Uh, potentially maybe a 5 tool player. From what you saw from last year, and maybe even in the minor leagues for that matter, what, what do you like? What, what else do you see from this guy as far as what he can bring to the table? Yeah, Ben and Tendy, like I said, I, the opposite field hitting I think will come. Like I said, we always say David Ortiz used the Green Monster pretty well. Um, Todd Nixon did, you know, a couple of the Red Sox back in the day, Troy O'Leary. So, you know, left-handers, if they can use the pull hitter, you know, we know the breeze sometimes goes out and the ball travels. You know, we think of a routine double sometimes becomes a home run off the green monster for a lefty. But, you know, I think the the pull's power will come. I think, you know, like I said, I don't think the power is going to be immense right away. I don't think he's going to hit 25 home runs. But mm-hmm. it wouldn't surprise me, like I said, if he's 15 to 20 with with uh, with some pull power. I think he'll be a 40 doubles guy, you know, maybe five to six, maybe almost 10 triples a year. I mean, he's not going to be a star, I don't think, his first year. But then again, you never know. Um I think the Red Sox, like I said, the the biggest thing I've heard from scouts is his effort and his and his desire. I mean, he was – some people think he was rushed to the majors, but obviously, you know, he got hurt a little bit. Uh, he spent one stint on a deal in the mid, middle of the summer. But he did pretty good for the for his uh, first round of uh, baseball and in, in the pros. I mean, he was a he, – he showed he could hit major league pitching. Uh, you know, he hit, hit, a, hit a home run in the ALCS, ALDS against the Indians in Cleveland. So mm-hmm. he definitely shows he can uh, hit it with the best of them and, and hit major league pitching. And I think that will definitely be uh, on display this year. Like I said, it will take time. Uh, we know we know some players wear down sometimes in their first full year, but hopefully, you know, it, the pressure won't be there and he'll be a, around a good group of guys. Like I said, the Red Sox have a good clubhouse, even without Ortiz. Um, he'll, he'll, he'll be uh, well-groomed, I think, to be a good player this year for the Red Sox. One guy that a lot of people are going to say that has that has some pressure on him going into this year is probably Pablo Sandoval. Now, I'll Correct. preface by saying this. This was a guy who missed almost the entire season with the exception of just three games. He had the shoulder injury. So you have to – so last year was canceled out. First year in Boston was somewhat underwhelming here with the Red Sox with the 10 home runs, 40 RBIs, just barely hit 245 his first year in 2015. This is kind of a – it is – be honest, yes, it is a show me year, but at the same time, it's a year where he's coming off of an injury. So you have to, I guess, temper expectations a little bit. But I don't know. I know we, when it comes to Sandoval, we always talk about the weight issues that he's had. But at the same time, I don't know if it's fair to say he has a, t- a lot of pressure on him or all the pressure should be on him. Because remember, this is the same guy who won, a, won some world, won three World Series with the San Francisco, San Francisco Giants, was – a big part of their World Series championship uh, run in 2013. Could have been the MVP if it were not for a, uh, a Madison Bumgarner in that World Series. So it's it's I think it's kind of unfair to say he has a ton of pressure on him. But, yes, there is some pressure on Pablo going into this into this season for the Red Sox. Yeah, and obviously we saw the photos we saw, you know, before spring training started that he arrived early. He, he looked a good, you know, 40, 50 pounds lighter, maybe even more. Um, they said he had a really strict diet and – 
you know, he, he worked his his tail off, I guess you could say, off this off season. And, you know, I think because last year he was overweight, like he's been he's been pretty much overweight his whole career. And, um, you know, I think I think there there is some pressure on him because of that big contract. He's got two more years after this, and he's he's making what eighteen to twenty million a year. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. Like I said, I think he'll be in the lower tier of the lineup, maybe sixth, seventh, eighth. We'll see. So I think automatically that should put a little bit less pressure on him. He's not going to hit 30 home runs and drive in 100 RBIs. You know, he's more of the 10 to 20 home runs, 70 RBIs. I don't. I wonder how his defense is going to be because you know his weight, obviously. But they, there was talk he would transition to first base, possibly with Hanley going to DH. But obviously that's before Mitch Moreland was signed. But mm-hmm. um, I think 280, 15 home runs, 80 RBIs, plays decent defense. That'll be fine for Red Sox fans. He's not going to be an All Star. He's not going to. I don't think he'll be as like his Giants postseason days anymore. But you know, if they have Brock Holt as a backup option, Marco Hernandez, they have some guys as depth. We know Brock Holt's an established player, so if he falters, you know, twenty million dollar bench player, that's not the best scenario in the world. But you know, we know Brock Holt's a capable player uh, if need be to play every day. Plus the Red Sox, and I know they don't want to go to this to go to the nuclear option here in twenty seventeen when they have a guy like a Brock Holt on the bench as a veteran backup. They do have a couple of prospects down on the farm uh, at the third base position that they are slowly bringing around. Both of those guys are still very, very young. And that's Deffers, who's only 20 years old. Dalbeck, who's only 21 years old. But those are two guys that down on the farm are making their way at some point being a factor, uh, maybe, certainly not this year, maybe next year, maybe 2019 uh, for that third base position. But third base is a spot the Red Sox really have to start to think about uh, the future of for this franchise. Yeah, and, and Raphael Devers is one of the top ten prospects, if you ask me. I know a lot of people have him, you know, with the top 20. But, yeah, he's only 19, 20 years old, very established. Uh, you know, a couple of guys who I saw her, uh, talked to saw him in the Greenville Drive in 2015 out mm-hmm. in the South Atlantic League, and they said his swing was amazing. I mean, he, he did pretty good. He's only hit about 10 to 15 home runs, so, you know, low teens – an amount of home runs, you know, but that's, that's good for, that's average for, you know, pretty good for a 19, 18, 19 year old coming up. So his swing's very good. His defense is pretty good. Yeah. I think like within the next maybe two years, he could be up. Like I said, I don't think you want to rush another t- Bryce Harper type young player. Uh, but if he's, if he's carrying up double a and you know, he could, and Pablo Sand, I'm not saying he's going to get called up like a Ben and or a Yom Moncada from last year, but if he if he if he can prove he can be better than Sandoval or maybe a Brock Holt, maybe you need to maybe especially if it's for a playoff uh, race or something, you never know because Ben Intendi fl- flourished in the tw- I think age twenty one twenty two so we'll have to see but like I said yeah Dalbach uh, Dalbach's uh, converted pitcher too um, yeah he he definitely seven home runs in about thirty games in in Lowell's last year so. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely a position of strength, and that's the Red, some of the Red Sox. They haven't had that since the early days, really, Will Middlebrooks, if you ask me. So there is mm. pressure on him, but the Red Sox have good depth, if need be, with uh, Hernandez and Holt. So uh, the Red Sox have good options. Like I said, the $20 million bench player is not ideal because we don't see that every day, if you ask me. I know you don't, not at all. And uh, you speak about – we, we talked about the, the power that this team has. Obviously, Sandoval – his power is probably going to drop off a little bit or expected to drop off a little bit going into this year. We don't expect a lot of big power from him this year, but you've got the two guys right now in the middle of this lineup, Ramirez and Mitch Moreland, more than likely going to be the three and four hitters in this lineup. That's a lot of pop for the, in this lineup at the first base DH position. Moreland, a guy obviously is going to come in here, try to replace big poppy, not from the standpoint of, of impact. No one can replace big poppy from that standpoint, but to provide some power and needed power for this team, in the middle of this lineup, that's a very good addition that they bring in over from Texas. And then obviously Hanley Ramirez coming off of a very big year last year. He hit over 30 home runs, drove in 111. Those are the, those are the, really the two big guys in the, in the center of this lineup here for the Red Sox this year. Yeah, I think, I think Moreland's probably going to be more of the lower tier, somewhere maybe 6th, 7th, 8th, depending on you know, if they're facing a righty-lefty. Okay. And, uh, you know, they said, they said that Hanley's not going to play much first base, but I think he was very good. I think he was a top five first baseman defensively last year, you know, and that's saying a lot because we we knew he struggled in left field in 2015. You know, he's moved around a lot, but he was pretty good. I mean, I think he made about less than five errors or so all year. Turned double plays good. 
you know, I think if Moreland needs a day off, you know, I, I, I'd like to see Hanley maybe start maybe 30, 40 games at first base, but we know Moreland's a gold glove caliber first baseman, and he's not going to hit the, you know, the sexy 290, 300 type uh, batting average. You know, he may be 250, 260, but, you know, I think the porch out in left, you know, the, the green monster is definitely going to help him tremendously. He's a good pull hitter. Uh, you know, he was good in Texas. You know, he's had some ups and downs. We know that's a hitter's park, but I think he'll flourish. I'm not saying he's going to hit 30, 35 home runs, but if he can, you know, like I said, 20, 25 home runs, play good defense and drive in maybe 80 runs, I think he'll be fine in lower tier lineup. And uh, he'll be good. Like I said, it's a one-year, $5 million, so not too much uh, back backdrop on it if, if he doesn't produce. So, I mean, they're saying Alan Craig, who's disappeared the last two years, is having a great spring. So, and no, I'm not saying he's going to be the winning the first base gym, first base job against Pittsburgh on opening day. But, you know, if Alan Craig's making a, a difference, you know, after two subpar years, three subpar years, uh, I think it'll be interesting, a little challenge here. But for Hanley, yeah, like I said, offensively, he came on the second half very good in August, September. I think he had about 15 of his 30 home runs in the in the last couple months. You know, I don't know. I, like I said, the health's always been the biggest issue for him. Uh, he obviously changed his workout regimen before last year and obviously helped uh, the wear and tear on him. He's in his mid-30s now, but, you know, going to DH will help him. He's got three three more years, two two or three more years on his contract. So, you know, he, he, he'll he be a good player. Like I said, fourth in the lineup, maybe Mookie Betts hitting third, but we'll see with Ben and Sandy. We don't know how this ro- lineup's going to be. You know, you could put Bogarts anywhere in the lineup too. So both of them will be good, but like I said, if both of them can hit 20, 30 home runs and play good defense and split time, it'll be a good, it'll be a win-win for the Red Sox. When you take a look at this team, how would you think this? Uh, before we get to Mookie, before we get to Mookie Betts and Pedroia, how do you think Farrell's going to try to set up this bench for this for this baseball team this year? Yeah, I think obviously right now, you know, you're probably going to have Sandy Leone, who really came out of nowhere, if you ask me. Uh, he was a really anemic hitter uh, before the last year. Uh, he really, I think he's probably established him as a starting catcher. So really, I think, you know, Blake Swihart, you know, they tried him in left field, another promising up and coming catcher, but he's had his throwing difficulties behind the cat, you know, dishes, you know, throwing out runners. He, they said he was even throwing back to the pitcher really poorly too. And that's, you know, you don't see that every day on the news or anything. So I mm-hmm. think right now it's probably Leon, the starting catcher, probably Christian Vasquez. Cause I think defense, they want a good defensive catcher on in the backstop. Uh, you're obviously going to have Chris Young, the the proven veteran, who who did pretty good. You know, he was he was injured a little bit last year. Played solid defense and you know hit some good home runs. He'll be probably your 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 fourth outfielder, and then a combination, obviously Brock Holt, Marco Hernandez. You're probably looking at right now. But like I said, if Alan Craig really comes on, you could see him. You know, they've had Josh Rutledge, a veteran, another veteran in infielder mm-hmm. who missed a lot of time last year. And then they're they're after really in in AAA is pretty good. Obviously, Steve Selsky, you got the outfield, Matt Dominguez, former Astros third baseman, and uh, combination Devin Muriel, Brian Bogusevic. I think Junior Lake as well. So they've they've got some good depth in the in the uh, minor league level. I'll give them credit for that because that's a that's a depth where they haven't really had the last couple of years. That's kind of hurt not hurt them, but it's uh, been pretty uh, poor, I guess you could say. They have better depth in in the minor leagues in terms of the offensive side, defensive side rather than the pitching side, so that's uh, a little worrisome. But you're probably looking, like I said, to recap, you're probably looking at Vasquez, Young, Holt, and probably a, either Mar- probably Marco Hernandez over at Josh Rutledge type right now because they want a little bit of speed off that bench, if you ask me. That's not bad at all. Not bad at all. And, you know, especially with a guy like a uh, like a Chris Young, just to, just briefly, just my take on him. I mean, here was a guy who really struggled as a, as an everyday player. He was He just couldn't hit. Hit for average at all when he was with Arizona. Mets brought him in, and, and they even tried him as an everyday guy for a little bit, and then they tried him on the bench. They really went back and forth, and he couldn't hit there at all. Since he's gone back, to, gone to back, got, gone to the American League and into the American League East, he's really enveloped this bench player role, and he's really turned his career around a little bit as a bench player guy. So uh, he is going to be—he's a big—he's a—he's a guy who's coming to a game late and can wreck a game for, for, for that matter and help help the Red Sox. Uh, get some runs on the board late in the in a baseball game, so he's a big piece too. Uh, just on last couple of players we, we want to talk about here. First on D- Dustin Pedroia, and I know a lot of people are always going to say, you know, how much longer has Pedroia got? He is 33 years old, and he's been playing his play in the league obviously for a very long time now. This will be his what 12th season in the major leagues. 
But I, I just don't see any slowdown in this guy. I mean, here was a guy who played 154 games last year. He still hit well over 300, still put it, put up productive numbers, still does not strike out. Had it had a career year, had had one of his better years in walks. I wouldn't say career year, had one of his better years in walks. I just don't see a slowdown from Pedroia anytime soon. Uh, what are your thoughts on him going into this season? Yeah, the biggest thing last year is obviously healthy compared to under 100 games in 2015. Yeah, it obviously helped. Like I said, you know, I think as tentatively as of right now, you're probably looking at him as a leadoff hitter. You know, he's 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 fluctuated between one and three. In the, in the spots in the lineup the last couple of years. But, you know, him, you can fluctuate maybe him, Ben and Tendi, you know, even Mookie, Mookie Betts obviously started last year as their leadoff hitter before, kind of, you know, being the three hitter. So I think Pedroia will be a nice leadoff hitter. But like I said, you can always put him in other spots in the lineup. You know, the the, the, fa- the age factor is obviously a big thing. But like I said, he he did have one of his better years. He's one of the better. His defense is, was, was outstanding like it is always every year. Him and Bogarts were very good defensively as a, as a double play tandem. Um, you know, I, I, I still think, you know, a lot of people are thinking his power. I mean, he never has been a huge power hitter. People are saying under 10, but he was another guy. I don't know what it was with the Red Sox in the second half, but a lot of players just hit a ton of home runs. He was one of them. I think he had what, like eight to 10 of his 15 in the last two months as well. So, mm-hmm. it, you know, and the RBIs were there. So he'll get, he'll get his walks. He'll, he'll play his good defense and hit for average. But like I said, he's, he's been probably one of the best second base Red Sox second basemen of all time, maybe the best. So, uh, it's, it's nice to see. Like I said, this Fred Sox team could score over eight, nine hundred runs again this year, and and play and be a good ninety-one team. So we'll see. But uh, I don't see a slowdown. Like I agree with you on that. Yeah, I just don't see it. And then of course the best player on this team, maybe the best story on this team is probably Mookie Betts because here was a guy in the minor leagues who was a I was one of the top prospects going through this system, but I don't think anybody really saw what we saw last year coming from this guy. This guy just erupted on the scene last erupted on the scene last year, and he was coming off of a solid year the year before in 2015. 31 home runs, 113 RBIs last year, 200 hits, 200 hits. Had really had an all all world campaign last year. A guy who steals bases, hits for power, he does it all and does it the right way. Clearly the best player on this team, and really the guy that they they are circling as. Uh, possibly the, really the French, the face of this franchise moving forward right now. If he continues at this clip, yeah. And the biggest thing a lot of people don't know, you know, me following the Red Sox system for so long is, you know, he was a skinny 19, uh, 18 year old shortstop in the fifth round that was drafted, and a lot of people didn't even know who he was. Yeah. And I think you could you could argue he's probably one of the best draft steals over the last ten years. Uh, because, you know, I, I, I wasn't really until like 2014 really, really broke out in, in low A, high A and double A. And I, I didn't expect the power to be there. I, you know, you know, a skinny short top five, nine, 160 pounds. You don't normally see that, you, you know, you, you don't envision him like a Troy Tulowitzki type shortstop build, but he obviously converted to outfield and he, and it was defense was very good. You know, people say he could still move back to second base or shortstop come tomorrow and still be a Gold Glove caliber player. I mean, he's really that athletic, you know, and he's he's a lot of he's number one the real or number two within a top fantasy baseball this year as well. So that's how special he is. My biggest question going forward with him is obviously, you know, not besides the contract talks, he's still locked up for a number of years. But where's he going to hit in the lineup? You know, he's hit he, with David Ortiz mm-hmm. gone. Is he going to go three or four? Right now, you know, I think they slayed him for four as a cleanup hitter. But, you know, his combination of speed and power, you know, I, I'm not saying that's not being underutilized because I still think if Pedroia struggles, he could still be a, a great leadoff hitter and still be a 30-30 guy. I mean, I really think maybe between one and three in the lineup, not not number two. Um, I really think if the Red Sox get struggle with that leadoff spot, he could still flourish here like he did early last year before the move to thir- three in the lineup. So, um, I think he's going to be a 30, 30 year guy for years to come. I mean, he just turned 24. I mean, you can't, he's, he's putting up Mike Trout type numbers every year now, and they're going to, the next 10 years is probably going to be really interesting to see who has better numbers, uh, between them. But like I said, he's uh he's a, he's a special guy with uh Ken Griffey type speed. If you ask me and, and gold glove caliber defense, if you ask me. Yeah. I mean, a lot of ways you can even, I'll even throw another name out there to compare him. I'll throw a, a Carlos Beltran early in his career. Correct. Was a guy that came up, and a lot of people really didn't know what what they were going to get out of him. Was a guy who was both a power and speed guy early in his career. 
uh, and eventually became a you know a 30-30 guy uh, by the time he was at the end of his run in Kansas City, going over to Houston, and then obviously to the Mets. That's that's kind of what he is now. Obviously, Beltran's a much bigger build than Mookie Betts is, but you do the numbers are there the, by comparison between the, between to, to those two guys. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Like I said, I think his his his, his he had over 200 hits, and that's the biggest. That's the most interesting about him is his his contact is really interesting because you know he he wasn't a really a much of a power hitter in the minor leagues, and it's like you know how do these guys develop so many power you know much power in a short period of time and only their second full year. He went from 15 to 30, to, you know, to the low 30s, and mm-hmm. and that's really interesting. How is he is he gonna, you know, go, eventually be like an Alfonso Soriano type of guy that will eventually be a 40 40 guy? You know, I don't know that. I mean, he's got a similar skill to Soriano, but obviously I think he's a be, uh, much better contact hitter, and uh, he just sprays the ball. I mean, he killed the Orioles. I think he had seven home runs against them in just you know a matter of like less than 10 games. So mm-hmm. it uh it definitely is going to be interesting. I don't know if he'll do 40-40 this year, but you know, I think he could duplicate. He was a, he was a 30, you know, low 30s and high 20s in terms of steals, but um I think he's going to be special. Like I said, I really think he's going to handle Mike give Mike Trout a run for his money with the MVP this year. And uh once those contract extensions, you know, start to t- creep in, mm-hmm. I'm not saying he's going to be a 300 million dollar player, but it's going to be very interesting because he's he's going to be well paid if he continues these numbers. Well, I mean, you're talking about the well, we, next off season is going to be the off season so that's going to that's going to set the tone uh, for yeah, Mookie Machado. Betts and Mookie Betts and a lot of other guys, especially when Harper cashes in. I mean, that's that's what that's what everyone's waiting for right now. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Like I said, I think you know Mookie is still under contract. I think for I don't think I don't think he's just in arbitration. I could be wrong. I think. I think you have to be year three before your arbitration sets in. But, yeah, it's going to be – a lot of people are saying, oh, is Bryce Harper going to be the next $400 million player? You know, not with this season last year. That was a subpar year. He's going to have to have a 30-30, 300-plus batting average to hopefully get those numbers. But, yeah, it will be interesting for sure over the next couple of years, see how him, a guy like Bogarts, will get paid. You know, these guys, Jackie Bradley, if he continues at that rate. So, Red Sox have a lot of cash to spend, but hopefully they'll use it wisely and uh, lock these players up because, you know, they'll they'll go three, $30 million on David Price. So I, I, I'm not worried about them locking not locking up a guy like Betts or Bogarts or Bradley if need be. How you, how, let's, let's jump right into this with this season and taking a look where this team fits in this division right now. We mentioned Toronto just a little while ago, and they are a team that obviously has won this division each of the last couple of years. They do lose a guy like Edwin Encarnacion in the middle of the lineup that does that will indeed hurt their RBI and home run leader. They still have a guy. They still have Tulowitzki there. They still have Donaldson there. They got Bautista uh, Bautista back on a uh, one year on a one year flyer. What do you think about this team going into this year with the Blue Jays? Do you think they're still the cream of the crop in this division, or do you think Boston can knock them off their perch here? Yeah, I think the Red Sox are still division uh, favorites at this point. Um, you know, a lot of people I talk to, I think just like I said, the Red Sox offense and they you know, I think their pitching, their starting pitching gives them an advantage. Like I said, I still think the, the Blue Jays have a very good rotation. Um, like you said, and and is a huge plus, you know, Kendrick Morales is still a nice player. He's going to hit 30 home runs, but he's not the, you know, he's not a, defensive first baseman like uh, you know Encarnacion and Encarnacion I still think is a good defender too he's not going to play probably much with Carl Santana but Mm -hmm. manning that position but you know their their offense is going to I'm not saying it's going to be weak but Batista's getting older he's not the you know the 40 home runs 120 RBIs guy he was three four years ago um, him and Morales will still be a nice four three punch or you know they may lead off Batista but you know, Melvin Upton, he's, he, you know, he had a nice bounce back year after some miserable, miserable years in Atlanta. Those were some of the worst for Braves fans down here in Georgia. But what's not? Pilar, you know, nice and bottom of the lineup hitter. Russell Martin, you know, he was a nice, you know, they had their offense wasn't bad. You know, I don't think Tulowitzki's going to be the, that 30 home run, 100 RBI guy again. But then again, you never know. Um, their biggest thing for me is, is how's their pitching going to be? Obviously, Sanchez, Estrada, Hap were very good. Those are I'm not saying it's going to give a Red Sox a run for sale price in Purcello, but that was very good. Francisco Lariano really came on, and obviously they'll have, uh, you know, a combination. You know, they lost Dickey, but 
they'll have other guys to fill in. So I think they'll have a good rotation. The bullpen will be okay, I think. Like I said, there's still a lot of question there between Grilly pitch well and Osuna, but after that, it's pretty much of a question mark. Their bullpen still has a little bit of issues. I think the Orioles probably have the best bullpen in this division, if you ask me. A lot of the uh, a lot of them still have some questions in the bullpen, but um, not so much Yankees. But um, yeah, I think the or I think right now I still think the Red Sox and then the Blue Jays. So uh, it will be interesting. Both teams have their similarities and their weaknesses, but I think the Red Sox still have the best offense in that in that division for sure. Yeah, I mean, with the Blue Jays, at least from my standpoint, I look at that pitching, and I just have questions all over. You know, J.A. J. A. Happ winning 20 games last year. I don't see that happening again. When he was with the Phillies last year, or uh, Phillies in his career, really was never a top top line starter, let alone reliever for that point when he was doing both with the Phillies. I just don't see him repeating that, obviously, this year. I mean, I could still see him winning 12, 13 games, but that's probably about it with J.A. Happ. Aaron Sanchez, very, very young, 24 years old. Breakout year last year, winning 15 games, going 15 and two. Will he do? You know, will he win 15 games again this year? Probably. Will he lose only two? Probably not. I think he'll lose obviously a handful more than that uh, going in forward into this year. So yeah, there's there's going to be some drop off for a lot of these guys this year for the Blue Jays. If you ask me, if you, you know, put a gun to my head, you ask me which who's the best pitcher in this Blue Jays team? Who would you take? In a big game, I would say probably Stroman, and he was coming off of a shaky year last year. So I do yeah. have my questions about the Blue Jays' starting rotation going forward into this year and their bullpen as well. Yeah, but Stroman obviously had an ERA in the mid four. He has to – that was his first full year healthy back from uh, some injuries. But, yeah, he definitely has to rebound. Like I said, Olariano, I don't know what a, what, what went off with him in Pittsburgh that really – because he had a really good 2015 – Right, coming from over from uh, the blue to the Blue Jays, it obviously helped them. So, you know, their their pitching is pretty good. Like I said, I think hand in hand it goes pretty similar to the Red Sox. So like I said, the Red Sox have more aces, I guess you could say, or frontline starters than the. But Sanchez is is going to be a great start. I mean, Hap, like like you said, I I have a little question. Can he get that nineteen wins, twenty wins in that? low ERA in the threes. I mean, is it because he's in the, he's more of a number four starter in his whole career. If you ask me, uh, type, you know, low mid four ERA, you know, average stuff. So that's interesting. And plus how do these, these blue Jays pitches are thriving in the hitters park. And that's, that's pretty interesting to me as well. But yeah, like I said, the other, the other, the Orioles, like I said, they have their pit, their, their, their starting rotations, uh, uh, atrocious. If you ask me, they have a ton of question marks. If you ask yeah. me, out of any, I mean, I know the Yankees still do, but I think the Orioles really have the most question marks. And that why they didn't address it in the offseason only kills me because their bullpen's very good with Britain Day, uh, O'Day, and uh, you got Givens and obviously Brock. So, uh, and their offense is still going to be pretty good too. I mean, if they got two good starters, they could have been up there with the Red Sox talk, if you ask me. So, uh, that that really is a killer, if you ask me. Yeah, my my one question. Give me your, who? How do you see the AL East uh, wrapping up uh, division? You know, one through five. How do you see it uh, uh, right, as of right now? I would say as of right now, and this is my honest opinion. Uh, I just have concerns about the Toronto Blue Jays. I just, just from the standpoint of losing a guy like Encarnacion, questions about whether the rotation can repeat what they did last year. I would probably yeah. say Boston finds a way to get that division. It'll be close. But I could see Boston yes, getting that 92, 93 wins to win the division. And I would say Toronto maybe being a two. I would say the Yankees are going to be a surprise team in this division. And I know it's hard to say Yankees is a surprise team, but considering all the pro- all the issues they have coming into this year, they have a lot, a lot of young players to bring up now that are Correct. getting experience. I could see them being a, a kind of a sleeper team, maybe a sleeper for a wild card. And then I would say Baltimore and then to, and then to Tampa Bay after that. Yeah, I think so. Like I said, I still think Tampa Bay still – they have a lot of question marks. Like I said, they they trade yeah. away for Scythe, and they still have a lot of question marks, obviously. I, I still still think the Red Sox, number one. I, I do agree with you. It's going to be a close race. I, you know, I think the Red Sox – I'm not saying the Red Sox are going to win 100. They're not going to be like the Cubs and win 100 in no. three games, I think it was. But, you know, 95 wins. I think it'll probably, they'll win a division by two or three games. I, like I said, I think the Red Sox, the Blue Jays, Probably the Yankees, like I said, I, I like the way the Greg Bird's having the spring train. I think they're pitching to be okay. Like I said, I worry after Chapman and Batances, but after that, you know, they, they still have a lot of question marks in that bullpen. You know, how's Sabathia going to be Pineda? You know, Pineda had a 
ton of strikeouts last year, but he was very up and down, if you ask me. And uh, Severino, you know, Tanaka's going to be good. They still have a little bit of rotation questions, but I think they're they're both, you know, Clipper too. They'll they'll be pretty good, I think, bullpen wise. Uh, but like I said, I'm, I'm wondering how is Aaron Judge going to be? Is he going to strike out 180 times and still hit 30 home runs? You know, like a Mark Reynolds type player. You know, is Clint Frazier going to mm-hmm. eventually be a Torres? They have, a, like I said, the young players are going to definitely step up. But uh, my biggest thing is how is Gregorius going to bounce, you know, feed off of last year? Is Castro still going to be good, you know, hit even more home runs? And, uh, you know, how's uh, how's life with Mount Mark Teixeira and a and, you know, the and Beltron? They don't have that clubhouse leader, but obviously hopefully Matt Holliday can bring that. And uh, that's a nice little addition. So I think their lineup will be good. But, uh, you know, Ellsbury and Gardner, we'll see. They're kind of tailing off. So their they're le- top of the order may be a little bit of a question mark, if you ask me. 